Hi there guys, it's Mike from MCQ Bushcraft here and welcome to another episode of Bushcraft Basics. In last week's episode we had a look at personal med kits and I just showed you my personal med kit, what I carry in the field with me because at this stage you're really going to want to carry a medical kit of some description out in the field with you just to treat cuts and scrapes on a minor level. And as we move into things a little bit further in later episodes we're going to be using heavier cutting tools like axes and saws so we might extend things a little bit further at a later date. But in this week's episode, I'm really going to give you a bit of an introduction into fire lighting tools that are often seen and used in bushcraft skills. And I've got a range of items with me here today. Some items are tinders, others are the tools. And you can see how these items match up and look at their pros and cons and actual functionality out in the field. And the reason being is because fire is a little bit like the centre of a bicycle wheel with the spokes coming out all around it and the, the spokes of the wheel are all the other subjects and fire is holding them together in the centre. It is so important, it's fundamental really to many different skills from keeping predators at bay to keeping you warm in low temperature conditions. Morale, probably one of the most important aspects of all outdoor living skills. Morale is, is incredibly important and probably not talked about enough in many respects the refinement of certain foods and the refinement of certain plants so you can actually turn them into soap or solutions to clean yourself. Something again that you don't see very often but it's really important in wilderness living skills if you're out for prolonged periods. Making glues, making cordage, the cooking of food so you can eat them, the sterilization of water. Fire is literally the core in many respects and it allows you to do so many different things which is why it's best to try and understand it in its entirety and never put it down for a second always practice it even in its most minimal state in your environment and what we've got here in front of us is a number of different tools and i've brought some tinders some common ones that are from my environment that i use quite regularly and what you'll find is the further you go into fire and the more you understand about the tools you use you'll start to Put them together into formulas and they'll match the weather conditions you're in and those formulas all come together for example if i go out on a very very wet day and it's tipping it down with rain and i've just got a ferro rod on me the last thing i'm going to do is look for a piece of tinder fungus to turn into a coal or an ember and then some dry material like this poplar bark here to actually blow into flame because that formula on a wet day that's really torrential is a recipe for disaster because it requires me to find a material that's already very absorbent to be dry and then another material that's even more absorbent to be dry in damp conditions and then to put one in the other to blow into flame and to obviously then get fuel on top of that fuel with tiny sticks that I need to be dry to make a fire and even though you can find small sticks that are dead standing meaning that they're dead hanging around in trees the first part of it is obviously the hardest in wet conditions. I'm far more likely to take my ferro rod and go out and look for something like fatwood which is the resinous core of a conifer tree which will light whether it's torrential or not or even birch bark that contains a lot of oil which will be fantastic to use in wet conditions because it works whether it's wet or dry and then use that with tiny dead standing sticks to make a fire which you may have seen me do many a time in damp conditions on this channel if you watch my videos. So just understanding how certain tinders work and being able to adapt them to various weather conditions is incredibly important and hopefully by the end of this video you'll have a brief insight into that and the kind of psychology behind it. But let's have a look at some of the tools I've got in front of me. What I've got here on the left hand side is a piece of iron parietes and really what this represents are, are very very primitive ways of creating a spark um, to try and obviously aid in making a fire and this piece of iron parietes I found on the chalk cliffs in fact there were quite a lot of nodules like this and the key to finding them is following the red oxide that's leaching out of rock faces and you can also find them on the beach but this is a very unrefined piece and it would take quite a bit of refinement to make it look and, you, and to really to be usable is what I'm trying to say. You would need to really buff this all back and you could rub this on a stone on the beach for example, take it right back and it would go quite black and then it could be struck by a sharp stone like this piece of flint here which can also be found on chalk cliffs quite commonly or even on riverbeds in a more unpure form often referred to as chert. 
and it can be struck and a very dull spark would be produced but the tinder required to be used with this would need to be very refined um, because of the spark is of a very low temperature but we've taken it and produced something a little bit more common these days this is a piece of high carbon steel and this is often referred to as the flint and steel and you can see the sparks produced there when I struck it onto the piece of flint. With the flint and steel the technique is very very simple but it really is about the quality of the piece of flint you've got. If you have quite a dull rounded piece of flint like this piece here then your chances of making sparks are very slim because iron is pyrophoric and what that actually means is um, it combusts in very very small amounts when it reacts in the air and also you can have some metals that react with water and moisture as well and they can also be pyrophoric so what is actually happening is you're striking this piece of high carbon steel that has a lot of iron in it against this piece of flint or chert and the flint is carving off tiny tiny fragments of the actual steel and it's combusting as it reacts with the air. It doesn't need to be done very quickly. You can see if you shave off tiny tiny amounts you can see all the sparks forming. So the technique really with the flint and steel is not to whack it really hard because what happens is, is you damage the flint and you end up dulling the edge but you just need to find a bit that's quite sharp and and just whip it. As you go down you do this and what that does is it actually directs the sparks this way like that because when you're using this method you can actually have a piece of material like char cloth or even a small piece of natural material which they would have used a millennia ago which is amadou which is the actual trauma layer of a bracket fungus like Fomes fomentarius. We've got a bracket fungus here. This is Fomes fomentarius which is one I brought back from Scandinavia. You can find it up in Scotland, it's very rare in the south, but there is some of it growing on the River Wye actually that I found not long ago. But this is the trauma layer and you can refine it down to a very, very small piece like this and it would be held over the top like that. And the sparks would then go into it and actually ignite it. And if this material is charred, it behaves even better. And that's really the key with the flint and steel. It's a fantastic technique of making fire when you're using charred materials. For example, if you take cotton, like a, a cotton bandana, and you put it in a tin with a small hole in, much like this one, you can actually char materials. So if you carry a small tin on you like this with a hole in it, you always have a chance of charring some form of material out there to a really good standard. You can char materials without a tin, like punk wood, just by holding it over a fire but having the tin really does help you refine that process. But I don't carry a flint and steel on me because its compatibility and functionality is actually um, very poor in my part of the world. It's, uh, it's quite damp. You can see the whole, f everything's damp today. It's been raining for quite a while and the floor is sodden, all the wood on the ground is wet. And my only real option in, in an environment like this is to find some dry nest material a dry cramp ball or piece of tinder fungi and use that or if it's really really wet to start turning to the resinous material that produces a naked flame and that's what I would do if the weather got really bad and it was quite torrential and had been like that for weeks so the actual usability of this tool for me is quite is quite poor in this environment but it is something I do actually use an awful lot when in you know doing courses and things like that I have to use this quite a bit but there is a way of carrying that setup in a different form that's more versatile and that's with something like this. This is a, a more heavy duty and it's made of carbon steel and if you take a piece of flint or chert and strike it against the blade or, or the back of the spine of the blade I should say you will get sparks and you can essentially char some material if you really need to put some sparks in them and you're therefore carrying a flint and steel setup but just in a more versatile and um, compact form in some respects so it's not like a redundant material that's just in your pack adding to weight. So the flint and steel isn't the most versatile of tools but certainly is quite a rewarding one to use and definitely a very good one to practice with but there are natural materials that can be used with obviously it can be used with cramp balls this is a cramp ball fungus Daldinia concentrica and 
if this is very dry and quite spacious and, and really mature and it's of the right age, it will work quite well with a flint and steel provided you get the technique right and that's really the main thing with it, it's all about the technique. Punk wood. Punk wood can be charred, it can actually even be used um, as is if you really get it in the right condition although that's a very very tall order at times but if charred it works very very well with the flint and steel as well and can be used to great effect so if you really had to and you had your carbon steel knife you could use some punk wood to char it and it wouldn't have to be put in a tin it could just be baked over a fire and it will perform quite well with the flint and steel. You do get various types of plant as well and at certain times of year the pith of the plant can be scraped out and used with a flint and steel and there are other kinds of fungi as well like chaga fungus can work well with the flint and steel at times although it does require a little bit of technique and we did talk about the trauma layers of various bracket fungi which can also be charred or used as is when refined slightly with the flint and steel so there are things you can use it with it's really just about understanding what you can do with it in your environment and matching it up with the weather conditions this tool here is a fire piston and fire pistons aren't really my favourite method of making fire. They're quite useful and they can be used to great effect if you have the right materials or a bit like the flint and steel you do need some refinement of the materials that you use and often they work better if the material is charred making it a lot more combustible. But the way they work is you have a piston and it has a seal on it and you have a chamber just there you put a piece of combustible tinder on the end and you slam this very hard and pull it back out quite quickly. Um, what happens is it works a little bit like a diesel engine in some respects. You've got a chamber there full of gas. You slam this quite hard. The gas heats up very fast to about 500 degrees Fahrenheit and basically ignites the material that you have on the end if that will combust quite well. And then you take that out and it should be smouldering and then you can transfer it across and this is usually the mistake a lot of people make they try and dig the ember out and then drop it in a nest when the reality is it works far better as if it were like a cigarette lighter you put it on a larger tinder you blow, transfer the ember across and then something obviously a bit smaller than that marble size goes into a nest and they generally work a lot better that way for me the fire piston isn't really a piece of equipment that I would carry in my pack it would just be dead weight a lot of the tinders you can use with this can be used with a flint and steel or an improvised flint and steel setup even if you find a piece of quartz in one of the riverbeds around here or a piece of chert it can be used and it will produce a spark if you've got charred material or materials that you've prepared quite a bit so it's not really necessary for me to carry this as I can use those tinders with an improvised setup if I have to. One method I always carry with me in my mind though is friction fire and um, friction fire is a fantastic way of making fire and I think if you're practicing bushcraft and you've been practicing for some time it is something that you should really know how to do because it really is that that primitive skill that you do not need to carry on you physically but it can be carried in your mind and the tools you can use and your understanding of your environment that's personal to you and your part of the world what woods work best can be used for you to assemble a friction kit effectively a friction fire kit for you to make fire with and there are many different forms of friction fire the one I use the most is the bow drill um, where you take a spindle a hearth board a bearing block and a bow and you can drive the spindle repeatedly into the hearth board um, to create a lot of heat through friction eventually leading to an ember and that can be blown into flame and it's um it's a very very good method for me to use in my part of the world, a lot of hardwoods and quite a lot of damp. The, uh, the bow drill really does excel in this environment. There is the hand drill as well, the hand drill's not too bad over here, it's not the best method but something like elder and clematis work quite well for a hand drill set. Bow drill was something I used and carried, just the only way I made fire for quite some time uh, when practicing bushcraft and it gives you a really intimate understanding of how to use it. And it's something that you should always carry on you in here because um, you never know when you might need it. And if you lose an item like this, for example, um, if, the art, if the environment is permitting, 
because um, there are very, very challenging environments around the world where friction fire would be an absolute struggle, where the damp is just so ingrained in everything that it would, it would take a long time to dry the wood in an already existing fire and the process would need to be quite quite refined really but if you do lose items like this it's, it's worth knowing those methods of primitive fire lighting skills simply so you have something that you can use and again an amazing thing to be able to do in practice but probably the most common way that I make fire a lot of the time these days is through an item called a ferrocerium rod and this is a ferrocerium rod here. You can see that this is my own ferrocerium rod that I've made. We've got a rod here which is about six inches long by half an inch thick of a fairly medium composite. We've got a piece of antler and a leather strap. The antler actually cracked in half. I had to glue it back together and make this leather brace. So that isn't there just for decoration. It's supposed to be holding the antler together with a bit of glue. And I've got some leather cord on and it can go on my belt and I can carry it and it's got a locking mechanism that I've made so it will never fall out and I don't have to worry about it dropping or, or losing it in any shape or form. But ferrocerium rods are um, really a combination of pyrophoric material um, made up of many different things, quite a lot of it is iron and cerium are the two of the main ingredients, you can look them up online. The amount of iron they add often determines how hard the ferro rod is because they can be bought in different composites. You can get very hard ones that, that generally require a bit more speed and pressure to produce sparks, but last a lot longer. And you can get very soft ones like this Light My Fire Army 2.0, which has uh, got quite a soft composite and it can be pushed very slowly, but it produces a lot of sparks, but it wears down a lot quicker. And they have their pros and cons and you can obviously make choices the further down the line you go. I go with a fairly medium composite, if I'm honest with you, and um, I really just adapt my technique to the fire rod that arrives and, and use it accordingly. If you're going to buy a commercial fire rod and you're new to bushcraft and you're looking to buy one off the shelf, then the Light My Fire Army 2.0 is probably one of the best ones you can get in terms of composite. It's a very, very good composite, performs consistently, comes with a very good scraper as well and as a beginner you don't really want to be using your knife straight away to do the scraping. Using one of these provided scrapers is ideal for just getting control and starting to understand how the ferro rod performs and then you can move on to a knife later down the line and then if you change ferro rods and you build your own, you build a custom one out of bone and a ferro rod blank or piece of wood then you may want to just carry a knife and the ferro rod and have it on your belt for example and you might not want a little striker kind of dangling around and that's fine but starting off with the striker is fine but now we've kind of come down to this tool here the ferrocerium rod or ferro rod or fire steel as it's nicknamed we can uh, start to understand the psychology of certain methods of using tinders in different weather conditions and I've got a range of tinders here with me and I'm going to just sort of show you how they perform and which one I turn to in certain weather conditions. The first piece of tinder that we'll start off with is this cramp ball here. These are sometimes referred to as King Alfred's cakes. Um, Daldinia concentrica is the scientific name because of these concentric lines and also coal fungus or cramp balls is another common name for them and not everybody will have these in their country that's watching and that's I'm not being specific here with this piece of tinder this is more of a representation of a class of tinders tinders that perform like embers and burn like briquettes and that's why we're using this one I've done a number of videos on them on the channel in the fire lighting section in the, the fire lighting playlist if you wish to to have a look at them but this represents tinders that perform like embers much like the trammer layers of this bracket fungi here they will perform like embers they will not produce a flame without this material here they need to be placed into this material to be blown into flame. But there are tinders that produce a flame straight off the bat. Things like birch bark, like pine pitch, or fatwood, which is what this is, and even waxes like beeswax will produce a flame straight off the bat. So we have two classifications of tinder. Tinders that produce flames, tinders that produce embers, and we'll talk about their pros and cons in a moment. But let's start off with this cramp ball here. If I take my knife, and I cut this in half. 
you can see all the concentric lines just there. And this tinder here is uh, quite brittle. They can be tricky to use. I always break them down even more so than that. Sometimes with my hands like this, we do not need that much at all, in actual fact. I mean, even that's quite big. But that piece there is absolutely fine. And we're not really gonna cover technique in, in this video. We'll focus on that specifically in next week's video. But there's a few ways we can approach this cramp ball, especially with this soft fair rod here. This technique here works very good with a soft fair rod because it doesn't allow much power. And you can see we've got a little spark in there after one strike, and that's simply because of the age of the fungi. It's a perfect one really to use. If you wanted to transfer it to a bigger bit, you could simply place that there and blow. And then the ember has gone on to another piece of fungi that's even bigger. But we do want to keep that piece, so I'm going to get rid of that. The characteristics of a tinder that glow like an ember, like this one here, like a briquette, is that they burn hotter and use more fuel when you blow on them which is very different to a tinder that produces a flame, a naked flame. And this is the thing, if you blow on a tinder that produces a flame, if that isn't established and it's very young, just a small flame, you'll blow it out. And that's the thing where windy conditions are concerned. If it's very, very windy, then you'll struggle with an open flame on birch bark. If it's in a large fire and there's a lot of heat and a lot of oxygen goes in, and it's an established fire and it will burst into flames, but if you blow on it in that stage, when it's very, very young and unestablished, you'll blow it out. I'll demonstrate in a minute, but you can see here that this is glowing very nicely. And then what we need to do now to convert that into an actual fire or flame is place it into a nest of dry material. This happens to be the inner bark of a poplar tree, which is very, very effective. And to be quite honest with you, on dry days, you can take a ferro rod and place it straight on the nest and just ignite the nest. You don't even need a tinder. And that goes without saying for a lot of nest material. If you're in dry conditions, then you very, very rarely need an ember. All you really need to do is just put a ferro rod straight on the nest and it'll burst into flames effectively. But you can see this really does help. I'm thinking about wind direction, the wind's going this way, so I'm not going to be like that, with all the smoke going into my face, inhaling it all. And you really want the ember almost partially covered so you can barely see it, because it needs to make contact with that outer material. There's no point holding it like this and blowing it like that. You really want it buried away. You can see that raw, and if we hold it just like this, it won't burn us until we turn it over, because obviously heat rises vertically. And we can put that down like this, and then we have a fire, and it will burst into flames. And obviously there's a lot more to that than just doing that to make a fire. We need a raft on the ground to obviously separate it from the dry ground, and allow oxygen to flow in, and that will eventually form our bed of embers. And then our fuel wood goes on top, which is tiny dry sticks and that's the foundation of the fire, and then larger fuel, fuel wood can be put on on top, and that obviously keeps our fire going for a lot longer. But you can sort of see how a tinder that performs like an ember behaves. You blow on it, it gets hotter, ignites surrounding material, it needs to be blown into flame. But there are tinders that obviously perform very differently. So if the weather was very, very damp and really wet and it was torrential out here, I wouldn't use that at all. Because this cramp ball material is most likely going to be wet. That nest material is definitely going to be wet and my chances of making a fire are very slim. So you can see that I wouldn't turn to that very often in my part of the world. But if we take this tinder here, 
it'll perform very differently. If I take my knife, it doesn't really matter which side of this birch bark I scrape because it's so resinous. You can see it in the colour. In fact, scraping this side will be better off the bat, which is the underside of the bark, just because of how much resinous material there is. And this is really what you want when you're scraping birch bark. You want lots of deep red shavings like that. And you can see them just there. And if I light that with the ferro rod, I can do that in a few different ways. I can use this technique, which is quite good. You'll see that burn, and if I blow on that, I've just blown it out. And that's a common mistake that a lot of people make when they're starting to use tinders for the first time. You need to know how these tinders behave. So if it was a very windy day, that would have just blown out. I really need to take steps to protect it in its beginning stages, in its infancy, when I'm making a fire. I can revive it. Almost. But unfortunately, it's got a bit bit tarnished now and it won't go. We've got a little flame there anyway, but most of the material has burnt away unfortunately, but you can understand what I mean by blowing on it. One thing I often see as well is a little ember glowing there, so if you're trying to get it going and you see some embers glowing, people will blow on that as well, thinking it's a bit like uh, a, a tinder like that performs like an ember, but it's not at all. You'll just blow it out and at the same time you'll scatter your material everywhere. What you really need to do is if it's glowing, hit it again and then you'll get flame. And that's really the key with that kind of material. And the same really applies with this fatwood here. Another resinous material, wonderful for wet weather work. And something that I turn to in coniferous woodlands, when I'm in coniferous woodlands and I'm just carrying my ferro rod and nothing else. And I'm really sort of just going out there and just testing out materials and enjoying the wilderness a bit. Then I really uh, look for fatwood on wet days. You can see it burns fantastic. Look how much it's burning but I can blow it out. So it's not like a, an ember that glows when you blow on it. When it's young, in its infancy, it's very, very fragile. So you can see how different tinders behave. We've covered quite a bit in today's episode. We've had a look at a range of tools, their compatibility. And we've also had a look at those tinders as well. And you can sort of see how they accompany different weather conditions and their pros and cons in many respects. I think one of the fantastic things about ferro rods is you don't even need really any material at all. If you carry a knife on you and you can identify dead standing wood then you can actually light fire feathers just like this one which is a brilliant way of making a fire and not really relying on too much at all. Almost had it. Once it's smouldering like that, a few more blasts with the fire rod, and it usually goes. But it really is just about making the curls as thin as you can possibly make them. And the drier the wood, the better. This one's got quite a bit of damp in it, so it's not catching quite as nicely as it as it should. But it's getting there. And if you made quite a few of these, it's a fantastic way of getting a fire going with just using the wood itself. It's just finding a wood in your environment that is quite soft and burns nicely. And obviously you wouldn't just use this, you'd have quite a few of these. So I hope you found this video useful. It's kind of like a crash course really in a variety of methods or tools I should say in making fire that the most common ones you'll see in bushcraft and a lot of different people use them. And also a bit about ferro rods, 
which is the tool we're really going to focus on specifically, and different kinds of tinders, the psychology behind different classifications of tinder. So you've got ones that produce an ember, ones that produce a flame, their pros and cons, and really an insight into which I choose in my environment. And that's really where the key is. You need to have a look at where you live. If you live in a northern temperate zone like me, then you'll probably see very similar materials around you. And you might adopt even the same techniques as me, or similar techniques. But if you live in a very, very hot part of the world, then perhaps it'd be very different for you. A ferro rod could be used just to ignite a bunch of grass that would always remain dry for 80% of the year, and you wouldn't really need to refine materials at all. So techniques will really differ all around the world and that's the key to get out there, have a look at different materials, start practicing and I would really recommend that Light My Fire Army 2.0 ferro rod for any of you out there who are looking for a ferro rod off the shelf. But in next week's video we're really going to focus specifically on the ferro rod and have a look at techniques and from there on out we'll actually start gathering materials, refining them, then moving on to heavy cutting tools and actually building a full blown fire and looking at the mechanics behind it. And please have a look at the links below, there are useful videos in there related to other fire lighting videos on the channel. And thank you again guys and I'll see you very soon.